by your design that every single one of us is here in this room. And so, God, we just um, ask that you would help quiet our minds, help us get away from, um, you know, thinking about what our neighbor might be thinking, and to just focus on you, Lord. We want to know you deeper, Jesus. And so, God, we just, um, we thank you in our own way. And so, my invitation to you this evening is to um, enter into worship that, you know, it might feel uncomfortable, it might feel new to you, but God is so worthy of our worship. He is worthy of um, anything we have to offer him, which we, we should give everything to him. And so, God, I just thank you that um, you're here in this place, Lord. And so I pray for every heart right now, God, that you would mend them together, that they would um, just feel different, God. We just love you, Jesus. Why don't you stand with us while we sing? I'm not sure. Yeah. Sorry, there. Here we are. Was on transpose. You gotta turn off that button. There we go. One more time. He's still here. Even when we play wrong keys.
Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm going to invite up somebody to do an announcement. I'm not sure who, though. Christian. Let's give a hand for Christian. Welcome to Saturday Night Light. My name is Christian. I'll be your host. Oh, what's up, guys? Um, SNL is a ministry of Northridge Church. You are all welcome to experience everything that Northridge has to offer. Uh, after tonight, we meet Sunday mornings and Sunday afternoons if you speak Spanish. If you have kids, ask someone about the different free programs and activities we offer during the week. Um, Northridge and SNL are proud to partner with Hope for Freedom Society. We are big fans of this ministry and count ourselves fortunate to work alongside them this way. Celebrate Recovery is a place to experience freedom from life's hurts, habits, and hang-ups. We have a group that meets Friday night just down the road at Highway Church, and there are literally CR groups all around the world. If you know that you're going to be moving out of town and want to know more about how to connect with CR where you're living, just let us know. We like to celebrate recovery here at Saturday Night Life. Uh, if you're comfortable with sharing where you're at in your recovery, please take a moment to stand and share your milestone. I don't know how many days I have, but <laughs> about three weeks. Um, take the Bible with you everywhere you go. YouVersion is a Bible app for your phone. It also has Bible studies, the ability to highlight and share what you're reading. Uh, check it out next time you have access to your phone. If you don't have access to a hard copy of the Bible, we have one just for you. Just connect with a leader following the service, and we'll make sure you get one. All our SNL services are streamed live on Facebook. Uh, oh, hi, Facebook. Uh, <laughs> uh, during the week, you can watch the replay on YouTube or check out our podcast version on Spotify. If you're watching online right now, stay connected by liking, following, subscribing, or whatever so that you never miss a service. Uh, and we serve coffee because we want to encourage you to linger and hang out. So make sure to refill your cup and enjoy a good conversation. Also, take some time to check out uh, the free clothing available for you tonight. It has been brought especially for you, so don't be shy. Take as much as you want. Once again, we are glad you're here. If you've got your Bible, you can open it to the book of Matthew and get ready to learn a little bit more about Jesus. He's the reason we're here. Thank you, Christian. Christian's a part of a very embarrassing story for me. Um, just, just one. Well, just well, it's a one that's kind of it's a, it's like a love triangle uh, almost, where I called, um, I was calling you Jacob all last week, thinking I was talking to Jacob. I'm like Jacob, you look different. You got glasses, and I knew you're tall, but I didn't know you're that tall. And then um, another embarrassing story, especially in light of what's happened this week. We lost Eric this week. I called Eric Christian probably about 10 times. Um, and so, hey, just so you know, our heart breaks with you. Um, that's, that's another hard one. And I hope uh, you understand how loved you are and how hard it is to hear of the passing of some of these guys and, um, and most recently Eric. So we love you guys. And um, yeah, we, we hurt for you. Um, kind of a hard to move off from that one. But I do want to say some thank yous. Um, I don't know if Jessica's, Jessica's probably attending to her boy, Hezekiah, but uh, today was like comfort food 
Um, some of you don't realize that Jessica has been a part of our SNL story since before I started to kind of get involved. And uh, so she's been leading worship uh, probably six years. I think we kind of brought her in full time to uh, lead the worship. But even behind the scenes, uh, her and Bobby have had baby Hezekiah, and, and so she hasn't been able to be up front as often as she has in the past. Um, but even with that, she's been the puppet master and organizing all the teams. Um, Josiah, do you mind putting me down just a little bit? Because I want to go closer to my face and I feel obnoxiously loud. Thank you very much. Um, and she's been organizing all the teams in behind, the, uh, behind the scenes. And I want to give a couple shout-outs. Rose has been a rock. I think you've been on about 17 different configurations of, of teams. And, has really, and you look like you're in an 80s rock video right now with a fan in your hair. It's awesome. I'm going to be distracted all, all service long. Um, and then some more fun stories. Uh, Spencer's a guy that you will have seen or you will remember from, I don't know where Spencer is. He's probably running back in or something like that. Um, but Spencer used to be very involved. Uh, he'd be playing keys almost every, every Saturday night uh, for the longest time. But he got adopted by our Spanish service. So uh, I, it's funny. I remember the first time he did, I said, Spencer, be careful because they're going to fall in love with you, and they're going to want you all the time. And he said, oh, no, don't worry. And then when he started, I think, his 17th or 18th Sunday in a row with them, I said, Spencer, are you okay? He says, I love it. He says he feels like he's really plugged into a place where he's needed, and, and every once in a while we get to borrow him back. And then Steve McMillan, who played drums today, is most often with our 10 o'clock service. And Steve and I, I don't know if you know this, uh, we were at junior high school together. So he's two years younger than me. He was in grade 8 when I was in grade 10, and I knew he was a drummer, and so I kind of outed him, and it's been, like, drumming ever since. He's So be careful, <laughs> you know the story, so be careful if you tell me that you're good at something or that you have a talent, because, <laughs> what's that? No, that's right, he, he didn't ever say he was good, but I knew he drummed, and so I, I, I hornswoggled into it. So anyways, thank you, worship team. You are amazing. Um, okay, I want to get right into the word today, because... I've, I've bitten off a bit of a, a larger chunk of scripture than I would normally take on, but it's all one theme. Now, we're in Matthew 23, if you're reading along uh, on your own. You're going to see the ESV version up on the screen, and I've got almost all of Math Matthew chapter 23 that we're going to go through. There, it, We stop um, just before the last section of it, and there's one part that I've pulled out, but I want to tell you about it because it it's no less important than anything else. Um, it's just that there's a, a real strong theme with everything else. So the part that I've taken out is this part where Jesus is telling the people, you know what, don't just swear on the, he's, he, he says, he kind of talks about how when they swear on the temple, they treat it more lightly than when they swear on the gold in the temple. And it's a bit of a, 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 a weighty topic to get into, and it's a bit of a distraction from what I want to, kind of share today, and so that's what I've taken out, but it's still there, it's still important, I'm just not going to be teaching on it very specifically today. Does that make sense? All right. Actually, let me pray before we get into this, because there's another weightiness to what we're going to be doing today, and I'll, I'll explain after we pray. Father, we thank you for this time of worship, time of coffee and fellowship, this time to gather together. Father, I pray that you would bless this time. Uh, Father, I pray that you give me the words to speak, but I pray even more importantly, because we know that your Holy Spirit can transcend the words that I choose to speak into the hearts and minds of everybody who is soft and ready to receive your word. And so right now, we pray that people would open their ears, and their hearts would be soft, and they'd be ready to hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, the thing that makes today a little bit weighty for me is because it's it's really quite interesting in my life and in the narrative of my life that this is the section of text that we're going to be teaching from today because it's, um, it's one I've been in conversation with with several people, but I'm going through something with a good friend right now. I hope you're watching on, on Facebook. I won't call you out by name, but we're having a hard time. We're, we're in a bit of a heated debate, a heated Jesus debate right now. And uh, I, I hope that he knows that I still love him, even though we're, we're definitely at odds right now. We're, we're, there's some things that we don't agree on. And what I want to make clear is I would never use this pulpit as a, as a place to make my point louder. And so the fact that we're teaching on this, uh, Steve can support me. We just go 
chapter by chapter. Last week was chapter 22. This week is chapter 23. And uh, so you're going to hear a very different message today. Um, and it's, we're just going to preach the text. Um, just in, by way of context, remember last week, Jesus entered into Jerusalem. And it was this incredible moment that was met by two very different groups of people. Remember the people that he'd been ministering to, healing, uh, doing the miraculous in front of? He was changing their lives, and they were calling him king, unabashed, unabashedly worshiping him as the king. Meanwhile, we've got a group of people we call the Pharisees and the scribes who are waiting for the Messiah. They're still waiting for God's Messiah to come and save the world. They do not believe that Jesus is that Messiah. And so they're very antagonistic towards Jesus. They're mad. And instead of worshiping as king, worshiping as king, they are plotting his crucifixion, his death. They're plotting his murder, essentially. So two very different responses to Jesus entering. And then we also taught on Jesus flipping the tables. And he cleansed the temple. He, he declared this is meant to be a place of worship, not a place of financial transactions. So with that as the context, we're in this interesting period of time. Steve taught last week about some of his teachings. And, and Jesus is doing some teachings, knowing full well that these are his last days on earth, literally. Well, until he comes back again. Um, they are his last days that he's walking through the city before he's going to be nailed to a cross. And he knows this is coming. And yet he continues to do what he was put on earth to do, and that's to teach. That's to, to bring glory to God, to, to point to the kingdom. And I'm just going to say one more thing before we get into the text. Knowing that people are out to kill him, Jesus does not cower in fear, and he doesn't turn down the volume of his ministry and his message. In fact, here in chapter 23, we see he cranks it up to 11. You guys know that, that reference? It's at 11. What's, what's the movie? Spinal Tap. Thank you. Good. Jesus turns it up to 11. Um, and here we go. Let's read. In verse 1 goes like this. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. Let's pause there. So Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And his disciples are the chosen 12, but with them would be gathering other people who are desperately wanting to hear the teachings of Jesus. And he's saying that the scribes and the Pharisees, they sit on Moses' seat. And it's a bit of a tip of the cap that they do know the law. And he's saying, listen to what they're observe. Uh, so do and observe whatever they tell you. It's good. The things they're teaching are my father's law. It, they, they know the law, and, they, and it's good. Follow their teachings, but don't become like they are. Do what they say, not what they do, is essentially what Jesus is saying in this moment. And we're going to see he follows it up with some real harsh words. Um, in fact, actually, sorry, just I, I kind of pump faked you there. He, he says here, they preach, but they do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders. Can we remember that part? In fact, we'll probably come back to it just a little bit, because that's going to be where I want to really kind of zone, zone in. Let's go on verse 5. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. Let me just pause for that for a second. Phylacteries is not a common word today. Um, these Pharisees were very, like, highly religious, and they literally wanted to have God's word on their mind. And so, like, they, they wanted to have it in the front of their mind. And so they would literally um, strap these boxes to their foreheads and to their arms, and it had in it uh, the word of God. It had scripture in those boxes and those are called phylacteries. So they were very demonstrative, walking around with God's word right on their forehead. You couldn't miss it. And then their fringes were uh, an expression, again, of devotion and a part of their religious practice. And the long fringes would show just how holy they are. 
So they were very demonstrative in their faith. They wanted to be seen, and they wanted to be seen as holy and followers of, of the true God. Um, their flactory is broad and their fringe is long, and they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. They loved the attention. They loved the status of being elevated in the religious uh, hierarchy, I suppose. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Now, this is a, an interesting part of text that we've got to be careful the way we read it. Sometimes when we read things, we can get a little laser focused and treat this as, well, the Bible says, don't call anybody father. That doesn't mean if, if you accidentally call your dad father that you're going to be struck with lightning or it's like swearing. It's just pointing to God as the one true father, pointing to Christ as the, the true teacher, the one instructor, and not trying to elevate yourself to be called father. I got to tell you a bit of a story, and I hope the people involved aren't online. I don't think they would be. Um, I was doing, uh, I was, did two weddings today, and one of the weddings I did was um, with a couple that, that, that I don't know super well. They're not churched people. And so um, when we were kind of going through the wedding, uh, we were sitting there talking, and then the lady's friend, the bride's friend, came in, and she wanted to introduce me. And she kind of panicked, and she referred to me as Father, Lord, and Savior. And I'm like, oh, that's very reverent. Um, and she said, I'm sorry, I don't know what to call you. I said, call me David. And, and so, so anyways, but like she wanted to show reverence. She wanted to call me something special. I've never been called that before, so, and I will probably never be called that again. Anyways, and you shouldn't long to be called that. So, and, and it really is somewhat of verse 12, whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Let's go on to verse 13. But woe to you. Now, we're going to go into several woe scriptures. Um, several parts of paragraphs where Jesus starts by saying, woe to you. And uh, you can see he's going to be pretty hard on the scribes and Pharisees. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. For you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across the sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, you, begin, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Let's, let's dwell on that for a second. This is Jesus knowing that these are the people, not only who want to have him killed, but who have the power to see him killed. This is Jesus showing no fear in the, in the face of those who he knows are going to have him arrested, tried, and crucified. This is Jesus who we see come gently to the woman beside the well, even though she's a sinner on her, was it, seventh husband? Um, and, and, and she's a Samaritan, somebody that the Jews typically wouldn't associate with, and a woman who in the cultural context wouldn't be somebody he would normally talk to. He comes to her gently. But when it comes to the prideful Pharisees, the Pharisees and the scribes who walked around looking down their noses at everybody else, that pride was something that Jesus was not going to let slide. And he comes at them hard. In fact, we see the times that Jesus is the most like aggressive in his tone or aggressive in his wording. It's with the Pharisees and the scribes. And he calls them hypocrites. And, and this line here, when they become a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. We're going to go on and see what he means by that. In fact, this is the part where we actually are going to skip from verse 16 all the way to 23, I think is the next slide, Josiah. Yeah, 23. But this picks up that same theme. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. 
you blind guides straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. The, the Pharisees were so particularly religious. They would literally, um, when they were observing the Sabbath, and this was true of, 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 of most of, of the Jewish people uh, at the time and the real devout Jews, is they would have limits to the amount of steps they were allowed to take on the Sabbath. So there were things they, they could not do because they would have to walk too far and violate the Sabbath. There were so many different rules that they had to follow because it was by following those rules that they felt justified. The law that they studied, the law that they followed, was, was what was going to save them in their minds. They were being saved because they were being good. And that's how they saw the world. And Jesus has said, and is, is kind of um, pointing out even more deeply here, that you're missing the point, and you're, you're leading people astray. And he talks about how particular they, they are about tithing a tenth. So when they start talking about the, um, uh, the, tithe, the mint and the dill and the cumin, um, my wife has got a, a, a vibrant garden. And they would literally, if they, uh, so actually I harvested dill last night. You'd be very proud of my gardening skills. Uh, YouTube is a great teacher. I harvested dill. And so they would literally carve out a tenth of the dill that they harvested and give that first tenth as an offering, which is the right thing to do. But they were so particular in those things. They followed those things so well, but they completely neglect justice and mercy and faithfulness. They are so, and mercy is the one you see over and over, they are unmerciful. And Jesus is saying, yeah, it's, it's good that you tithe. That's, that's fine. That's good. But you've, you've paid attention to the little tiny things and neglected these huge issues. Justice and mercy and faithfulness. Let's move on to verse 25. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup of the, and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. Um, again, we're not talking about the sin of doing bad dishes. We're talking about their focus on the part that people can see. They're not caring enough about the inside, about their actual heart orientation to the Father. They just want to be seen as a clean cup. And it goes on uh, to kind of double down on that idea in the next verse, please, Josiah. 27, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Okay. Um, let me tell you how I would preach this differently on a Sunday morning than I would here. Um, and this is, this is me being kind of stereotypical. But I think the message that I've got to kind of work on the, the regular Christians is, is sometimes we can be like the Pharisees. We can be so worried about the way we look uh, you know what? I got to put my hand up as guilty. Wh I've got three kids, and the w when they were younger, I'm sure I can't quote you a conversation, but I'm sure I threatened my kids to within an inch of their life. If you embarrass me in church today, boy, you're gonna get it, or maybe you won't go to McDonald's after, or something. I had some massive threat. I I wanted my kids to look good so that I would look like I was a dad who had everything together. I th I think a little bit more about maybe what I wear on a Sunday morning than I would on a Monday morning. Because I want to look like I've got things together. I don't always confess the things that are hard and that I'm going through because I want to look like I've got everything going together, like I've got everything figured out. Honestly, church, one of the things I love most about this group of people, and this isn't me just blowing smoke, is many, if not all of you, have come to the point where you realize that you are not enough. And you've broken through, and you've made yourself vulnerable, and you've said, I need help. 
and, and whether sobriety is the catalyst for crying out for help or whatever, the point is you come to this space not full of pride, but full of humility, ready to receive what God can do in your life. And that's why stuff happens in this room, is because you make yourself available. Right? And so, I'm, I'm going to again get to my point. I, I would probably preach this differently on a Sunday morning than I would on a Saturday night. Here's my, my thing that is kind of burning in me with, with you, and this is a weird one. I don't normally preach like this on a Saturday night, and I don't know if this ap- applies to one of you, half of you, or all of you, but this is what I'm seeing. Um, I see a lot of people coming out of recovery that become very bold about where they stand on issues, and I see it especially on social media where they are very uh, direct about sin, which can be good. It can be good. But the thing is, in the context of social media, you're just kind of throwing it out there without the actual relationship to work it out with somebody. You're calling out sin without actually having the relationship to walk with them to a solution. And, and I'm not necessarily calling out the calling out of sin. I'm calling out the forum in which we do it. I, I think that we look a lot like... Uh, can we go back to that first slide in verse 4? Verse 4 says this. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders. What I'm seeing online is people are making it harder to walk with Jesus than he wants it to be. He's inviting us to enter a relationship with him where he describes it. He says, my yoke is easy. And what he's saying is, hitch your wagon to me. Do you guys understand what a yoke is? It's not something we use very often, but like if you got two oxen, that's plural, right? Two oxen, there's this wooden thing that would attach the two together, and together they pull, and they can pull with great strength because they're bound together and pulling together. And, and God's saying, my yoke is easy. Come saddle up, not saddle up, but tie up next to me. And who's going to do the heavy lifting there? Obviously God. Okay? We're kind of just along for the ride. We're kind of arm candy when it comes to that relationship. He says, my yoke is easy. What the Pharisees are doing is they are tying up heavy burdens, hard to bear and laying them on people's shoulders. When we make our social media existence about making faith more uh, uh, creating a barrier to walking with Jesus, saying that you're not worthy to walk with Jesus, you're not worthy to walk with Jesus, you're not worthy to walk with Jesus, and pointing it out that way, if we do that, we are actually tying up heavy burdens. We're telling people that you've got to get good enough to walk with Jesus. And I'm trying to think of a non-swear word to s- say that what that actually is. It's bull poop. That's not true, that you don't have to clean up or get better or straighten your life out in order to walk with Jesus. Jesus wants to walk with you now, where you're at. When we, when we look at the story of the prodigal son and, and the, the most sinful, and again, he wasn't necessarily a real person, but he was a description of somebody who had just made all the wrong choices. But then when they were ready to humble themselves and come back to the Father, he didn't kind of look at him and go like, oh, come on. First, I got to hear a really good apology. That's not what he said. In fact, he didn't say anything. He dropped what he had and he ran. He ran towards the sun. And he threw his arms around him and he put his coat on him and he gave him his ring. And he threw a huge party. He didn't ask questions. And when the son said, hey, you know, I'll just, I just want to come. I want to be a part of the household, but I'll be a servant. No, you're my son. Not, you, not, we will work together to make you my son again. You are my son now. And that's the gospel. That's the good news. And the truth is, when we, when we point to people, again, on social media, which I love so much, and we tell them they're not worthy, it's true. But neither are we. And we can't be. There's nothing we can do. These Pharisees who are doing everything right are not worthy in their own steam to walk with Jesus, to be a child of God. And we can't be. There's nothing we can do to be worthy. So when we put that out there, 
all we're doing is tying up heavy burdens and making it harder to bear, harder to enter into relationship with Jesus. And you know what? I think that is so incredibly dangerous. You know what? I know that I've made stupid decisions. I've said dumb things, sometimes probably from the pulpit, that have made somebody think, oh, I can't, oh, if, he's, if that's, he sound, that sounds like me, I guess I can't walk with Jesus. If I've ever done that, and if I ever have a day of reckoning, that will be heartbreaking to learn that I've done that, that I've caused somebody either to stumble or that I've created a barrier between them and Jesus. And really, that's what, that's what the money changers were doing. They were creating a, a financial barrier to forgiveness and to relationship with the Father. And the Pharisees, by heaping these heavy burdens, hard to bear, they are making the approach or the, the relationship with the Father more difficult, if not impossible. I can invite the worship team to come back up here again. Here's the good news. This, I, th- if this is a harder one, and I, I feel like I'm making my unhappy face or whatever. Um, the, the, good, the good news of all this, and actually I was talking to Carol Lee about this because I was like, I feel a little uncomfortable about tonight's message. message. And, and she says, well, David, Point to the hope that we have because of what we're learning here. The hope is this, is that it's not about listening to the Pharisees. It's not about getting good enough to be with God. It's about what Jesus has done for us, right? And and because of what Jesus has done for us, we can have hope. There is hope for hope because of what Jesus has done for us. And we don't need to get everything right. And when we've got a history of doing things wrong, we're not beyond hope. Hope is available in an instant, just like when the prodigal son came to the father. Hope is available instantly when we humble ourselves, repent, turn from our sin, and turn to Jesus. We're going to talk about that a little bit more after we respond in this one song of worship. One song of worship? One song of worship. So let's stand together and sing together.
All right, have a seat. That lyric actually really sets up what we want to do right now. Um, when we say there's nothing better than him, it's kind of in our vernacular, in our way of saying things, it's, it's putting him in his rightful place on the throne of our entire lives, all over the, the throne of the universe, the throne of everything. There is nothing better than you. And really, that alignment is, is what humility is. Um, again, we've got this, this stark comparison. The Pharisees thought highly of themselves. And though, and so they, they were very full of pride. And then Jesus is calling us to be humble. And even says those who are full of pride, they're going to be humbled. And, and the humbled or the, hum, the humble are going to be exalted. And I think he says that because really that is the core ingredient of coming into relationship with him is our humility is understanding that we are not enough, okay? Understanding that we can't do it in our own strength. And so this is, this is kind of the gateway to, to walking with Jesus. This is, the, this is kind of the, the open door that we all get to, are invited to walk into, is walking in humbly and choosing to follow a king. And so the way we teach things here is, and we always like to put this out as an invitation, um, if you are at the point now where you are ready to admit that you're not perfect, if you can humble yourself, again, like the prodigal son who returned to the father and said, you know what, what I was doing wasn't working. I want to come back under you. I want to humble myself. And if you're ready to admit your imperfection, your brokenness, your sinfulness, that's the first step. Then B, if you believe that Jesus paid the price, because what the word says is the wages of sin is death. So what we are owed, you know, if you go, uh, Jaden, you started working. Where did Jaden go? I saw it. Jaden just started working recently for an arborist company, correct? Uh, you said you're climbing trees. I assumed you're cutting them down as well. Anyways, so if, if Jaden works a full day of work, he should expect a payment. And when he works a full day of work, his payment is such and such amount of money. When we sin, what we are owed, our payment, the wages of sin, is death. That is what we are owed. But the free gift of God is eternal life. And that means that Jesus paid that price. He paid what we owed. He paid the wages of sin so that we could be free and live forever in that freedom with the Father. If you believe that Jesus died for your sins, that's the second stage. Second stage. It's like a video game. Level two. And then the third one, this is the repentance part. It's not enough to say, hey, Jesus, you're great. Can you forgive my sins? And then we just go keep living life like we always did. The third part is key. If we're walking towards death, doing our own things, following ourselves, and we keep walking that way after receiving this beautiful forgiveness, we're still walking to death. But when we commit to following Jesus as king, it's this 180 degree repentance where we're walking a different way. We're committing to following a different leader other than ourselves, other than the, than the enemy. And so that's the third thing. If you're ready to commit your life to following Jesus and seeing where that takes you, um, then we want to give this invitation for you. So what we like you to do is bow your heads, close your eyes. And the reason we do this is this is something between you and Jesus. And we want to ask you, if you're ready to admit that you're a sinner, if you believe that Jesus paid the price for your sins, and if you're ready to commit your life to following him, just invite you where you're sitting, just to put your hand up and make that declaration today that you want to make that decision. Awesome. Beautiful. I see one person I need to learn their names, yeah? <laughs> All right, you can put your hands down. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. 
July 29th, 2023. And, and for some of these guys, this is the day where they became a new creation. They decided, and they have become, and you have adopted them in to become a citizen of heaven. That they are a child of God. And they are walking with you. And Father, we know that you and the angels are having a party right now celebrating this decision where, where they were on a track to death and now they've been stolen and saved from death and are walking towards life. And Father, we pray that right now you would protect them, protect their hearts and minds as they walk this new path. Father, and I, I just pray over the rest of the people in this room, uh, the community around them, that we would rally and that we would support them in this new walk, be a blessing to them and would help them in the hard times that are inevitably going to come. And Father, I, I just want to wrap it up with a, a prayer for, for Eric and his family. And, and for this family, Lord, and this community, we know that uh, the loss of Eric has, has hit us hard. And I just pray a, a blessing of peace. Your word describes a peace that does not make sense. And right now, peace doesn't make sense in the light of Eric's death. But we know that your Holy Spirit, that you can come as the Prince of Peace and you can bring peace into a situation where it doesn't make sense. It's surprising. And I pray that over the house. And I pray that over the friends and family of Eric. Uh, if anybody from Eric's family is watching online, we pray this over you. We pray peace. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Um, on a technical note, oh, this, this, this is a hard turn again. Um, we are not here tomorrow. So I hope that's been communicated to the host that we are going to be at the Albion Fairgrounds for Country Fest. Um, and so we look forward to, well, I won't see you there because my wife and I are going to be on a ferry. But uh, it'll be a good time of gathering. With that in mind, there are no services here tomorrow. So if you don't mind stacking your chairs in stacks of 10, feel free to linger and sing along because I know Jessica hates it when we pack up too quick and I don't want to get in trouble. But uh, stacks of 10, and we will see you next week. Be blessed.